please welcome Vice President of Network Planning for Spirit Airlines, John Kirby, Vice President of Network Planning for Southwest Airlines, Adam DeCare, and Vice President of Network Planning for American Airlines, Brian Zanadans, in conversation with Skiff Airline Weekly Editor, Edward Russell. Well, I told you you'd never be rid of me, but uh, <laughs> this is our last panel, and I, I have to say this is the one I've looked uh, probably the most forward to today, uh, the network planning panel. Um, before I introduce my guests, I have to say, uh, so when I was a young av geek growing up, I used to draw route maps for my own airlines, um, you know, spanning the network, the, the US, though I have to say, uh, I think all three of these network planners would, uh, assure, would prom assure me that my airlines would have uh, completely collapsed at this point. The you know, I mean, Dayton hub probably was not the smartest thing, but hey, it was nicely placed. Anyway, uh, I move on to my panel. Uh, next to me, I've got Brian Snottens from American Airlines. We have Adam DeCare from Southwest Airlines and John Kirby from Spirit Airlines. Before we get started, I should say, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please submit them on the app or online, and we'll see them up here, and we'll, we'll get to them before the end. Anyway, to start out, I would love uh, each of my panelists, if you guys could fill us in on some of your network capacity plans for next year. John, why don't you start us out? Yeah, obviously, we're, we're still working through a lot of things, we, we, like we all do. You build your budget plan for next year. You project your growth, um, but a lot, of, a lot, of, and we'll probably talk about this on the panel. A lot of the constraints that we're facing as an industry, things we're working through. But we we are pl planning to take delivery of 33 uh, new aircraft last year, uh, next year, uh, 20 320s and 13 A321s, and we'll, we'll be taking our first ever A321 in probably the April May time frame. Adam. Yeah, so our focus uh, for next year is going to be a lot of um, restoration. And what I mean by that is that we started um, the pandemic like everybody else. We didn't know what was going on. Um, and then one of our reactions to that was we went and we opened up the 18 new cities. Uh, we went through that. Uh, that took us about 100 aircraft uh, to go do that. Then demand came roaring back, so that's fantastic. We're all happy that it did. Uh, and now we want to take the airplanes that we get and put them back into this, the, the kind of air, the cities we borrowed them. So 23 hopefully is a boring year. I'm signing <laughs> up, if I can sign up today, I want to sign up for boring next year. Um, and we want to just get kind of back to the basics. What do you mean, Adam? I love writing about uh, Southwest adds three new cities and stuff. Yeah, it was fun <laughs> for that year. <laughs> Brian, what about at American? Yeah, we'll take the boring year as well. Um, we are continue to be focused on planning uh, to our operational capabilities. Um, so through the pandemic, we focused on building as many O&Ds in our network as we can. We built about 16,000 O&D pairs. We'll continue to do that going forward, grow it as much as we can. But we continue to be an airline that could be 5 to 10% bigger than we actually are based on our infrastructure. So our focus is within you know, operational constraints to, to squeeze as much out of our assets as we can and continue focusing on O&D construction. Well, that, I mean, that, that's a great segue because we, uh, I spoke to Robert Isom, your, your boss this morning, and he also talked a bit about constraints, but that's what we're really seeing uh, in this year. This, this new year is, is between pilot staffing, uh, availability of aircraft, though, John, it sounds like you have no problem getting a few aircraft from Airbus there. Um, so how is that limiting your ability to, to do everything you want with the network? And I'm going to kick it right back to you, Brian, because you're just talking about constraints. You said 5 to 10 percent more. Yeah, so we have a number of constraints that we're dealing with in the network world, obviously. One that's well known as pilots, especially on the regional side. Um, but also, you know, Boeing um, finally started delivering 787-8s to us after a couple of years of delays there. So we're happy to have those airplanes coming into the fleet, and, but it's still difficult to count on the time period that they'll come in. And so we are planning their deployment closer in than we would like. Um, so it, you know, we, we have a budget just like the rest of the airlines, I'm sure, do, and we work through that. But um, as we progress through the year, budget becomes less relevant, and we're just seeing what it, we have to tackle on a day-to-day -day basis. And, Honestly, the airline used to start with a network um, through my career. It's always started with a network, but right now it's starting with operational capability, and then the network stems from that. 
And that's very important, especially after the, the issues that we saw at several airlines uh, spring, early summer. You know, everyone appreciates a good operation and stuff. Adam, what about you? What, how are the constraints impacting Southwest? Yeah, it's the same as I'm sure as the other carriers. Uh, and what we're learning is it's just a difference in the way that we're able to address those issues. Uh, prior to the pandemic, everything was kind of, I don't want to say routine, but it felt more routine than it does today. Uh, in the, you know, whether it was the, how many uh, pilots per plane you needed, how many flight attendants per plane you needed, everything was pretty kind of well thought through. Uh, and the pandemic obviously changed that. So we had to shift the way that we thought about the construction of our network. Um, and so what we did is we focused on a lot more short hauls uh, and it was able to move pilots around and flight attendants around. So if there was an issue or, or a problem with a particular weather or weather city, we could move the crews around much more effectively. And we sort of kind of learned that uh, last year, made the, the changes we needed to make into the network uh, and you've seen us run a much better operation this year as a result. Okay. And John? Yeah, we're in a little bit of a different situation in that we're actually up about 25% in the fourth quarter of 2022 versus 2019. So we've actually been growing through and certainly coming out of the pandemic, um, but we've been much more deliberate. Um, you know, we've talked about the pilot situation. We continue to take delivery of aircraft all through the pandemic. So um, our growth was basically built in. We haven't seen the delays on, I would say from Airbus, that maybe some of the other folks were talking about, certainly not the length of delays, so that's been a positive for us. Um, but what happened was we stopped uh, hiring pilots during the sort of the dark days of the pandemic, but we kept on taking delivery of aircraft. So some of that is catch up. Our pipeline, our schoolhouse, uh, our pipeline is robust, our schoolhouse is full, but we're seeing more attrition rates than we had seen previously. So where maybe the schoolhouse was nearly 100% for growth. Now it's some subset of that uh, to cover attrition. The, the other thing we were really focused on, even pre-pandemic, um, we redesigned the network to make it more out and back, over 70% out and back. We loaded that schedule for April of 2020, and we never flew it. Subsequently, we, we redid it again, and we loaded it for April of 2022. And in addition to that, on June 5th, we, we started implementing a lot of investments in the operation, uh, increased block, crew buffers, um, starting uh, new crew bases, um, some investments in um, technology as well, to really make sure we had a much more robust recoverability and resiliency in the network. And we had, the good news is we had our best summer operationally ever. And we recently even tackled two hurricanes in the state of Florida, where about 45% of our capacity touches, and we were able to recover very quickly. So worked out really well. So now what we're doing, if you listen to our earnings call, uh, Ted Christie, our CEO, talked about getting back to full utilization. So I'm working very closely with our ops team to see how much op hours I can operate, but also we're metering the amount of capacity we put in the state of Florida as the ATC system, particularly in the state of Florida, the Jacksonville Center ramps up. So re more recently, I've had to make some adjustments to take some flying out of Florida and put it more in non-Florida routes as well. But overall, we're seeing a very steady increase in the amount of capacity we can grow, but we're not quite at where we want to be. So John, that that's, leads me into my next question for you now. I, I reported that Spirit had suspended flights to some 35-ish cities in the first half of next year, which, you know, uh, to be clear, you know, the schedules change regularly. Every airline does it. So, you know, many of the, many, if not all of those routes are, are coming back next summer. But um, you were telling me about, you know, you, you, the constraints clearly have impacted your, your spring schedule, just how, how much you can fly and stuff. I mean, talk a little bit about, like, with, within the new year, I mean, you've got caps and out of Florida. I mean, how's that, uh, you know, you're finding new opportunities to fly. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, and actually, could be the last part that kind of echoed when um, op where our opportunities outside of Florida are. Is yeah, it, you've got yeah. some caps that are limiting uh, that, that were part of the reductions uh, for Florida, but you're finding new opportunities outside for the network uh, and routes. Yeah, no, without a doubt. I mean, I'll piggyback on what Jude said. I think the you know sort of the Mark Twain right the. Uh, you know, the, 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 my, the uh, see, now I'm forgetting the quote, but uh, <laughs> basically uh, the, uh, you know, my death has been exaggerated, right? We think the UC, ULCC model is still very robust. We see tremendous amount of opportunity. So when I looked at, um, you know, moving things out of Florida, we just basically went to the next page and said, okay, 
Where are the non-Florida opportunities? In, in the case recently is just simply moving uh, things up that we probably were going to start in the second and third quarters up to the first and second quarters. So um, we've, uh, we've shifted. I, I've been with the company about four, a little over four years now, and we were very Eastern-centric. And we, we not whipsawed, but we shifted uh, really our, our city presence going into markets like Sacramento and Orange County, Burbank, more recently uh, Reno, uh, Albuquerque, Boise. Uh, we're becoming more of a national. So when we look at maybe metering Florida a little bit, um, we see we, we have a lot of opportunities, but we still would like to have the opportunity to fly as much Florida as we can. As Ted said on the earnings call, again, Florida kind of is who we are. Absolutely, and I mean, if anyone's been to an airport in Florida, you've probably seen a spirit plane there. So plenty going on. So Adam, I want to ask you, I mean, these probably doves and dovetails with some of the, the constraints, but you know, Southwest had framed 2022 as its scheduled recovery year, and now you're talking about 2023 being, so, you know, and continuing that. I mean, why is that slipped into 2023? Is it uh, aircraft? What is it? Yeah, like I said, it was about 100 aircraft to open up the, uh, um, the 18 cities that I mentioned. Uh, we also had a pretty, uh, a pretty good expansion in the Hawaii. Right. Uh, and so we had uh, a lot of aircraft that went to that and just putting 100 airplanes back onto the network. So if you thought, you know, roughly um, in 2019 that we were roughly about seven, 600, 700 aircraft right in there, um, we got to get up to that kind of magic number around, you know, 800 or so that gets us back to that kind of uh, space of restoration. So that's kind of been our focus. Uh, and it just takes a little bit of longer time to do that with the uh, pilot training that's going on and everything like that. So we'll get there. Absolutely. And that's, and when we, t uh, just for our audience member, like when we're talking about restoration, it's sort of adding that depth. Southwest hasn't pulled out of any domestic cities, for, but it's, it's adding the scheduled depth that hourly service where, you know, yeah, so. We didn't close any domestic cities during the pandemic at all. Uh, we had some international temporary closures, but we've returned back to all of our international cities. Uh, we're actually proud to say that, that I think we're the only carrier that, that can say that, that we didn't pull anything out of that. Uh, and we continue to maintain uh, all of our flying uh, into that. So we're very excited about that. It's something that we believe uh, we're part of the like, partnerships with the communities that we're in. Uh, and we provided a lot of uh, services during that time, whether it was bringing in you know, equipment or health care services or healthcare care workers uh, during the pandemic. And there were some flights that that's all that was on that airplane, I promise you. So uh, it was important for us to continue to do that. Great, great. Oh, Brian, uh, for an American, one of the exciting things that you guys did during the pandemic was uh, you, you added a bunch of routes out of Austin, which was outside of, so those familiar with the network carrier, typically all the flights come to and from their hubs, but Austin is not an American hub. So what, what happened there and what's going on? So, you know, we as network planners, and it's pretty much universal, we follow demand, and demand is generally created by GDP and population growth. And Austin's been a leading city for population growth over the last 20 years, and businesses are moving there. And so it was clear that in order to compete in Austin, we needed to add nonstops to Austin, not just to our hubs, but across the country. So over the course of the last year to 18 months, we've added 35 new nonstops to new nonstop markets from Austin. So now we're serving about 400 O and D pairs together with our partners from Austin. That's four times more than our our closest competitor in the market. Who and might be sitting next to you? Might right be. Now. Might be. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 overall, we you know we're serving from a, a nonstop basis on a passenger weighted basis. We serve more nonstop points than our next closest competitor as well. So, of course, the network guys are going to say that you know having the competitive network is what gets you in the door for uh, entry into a frequent flyer program, credit card acquisitions, all of these things. We're seeing those benefits in Austin now as we build out the schedule. So we're very happy with it, and we're we're wild for Austin. Nice. So does does Austin now consider you consider it a, a focus city, quote unquote, or is it is its own thing? Uh, we don't we don't really use that term in our network. It, you know, and, uh, it, there's no graduation from spoke to focus city to hub. <laughs> um, it's you know we're just you know collecting flights there in order to serve more nonstop markets to across the country where we uh, couldn't serve it well over the hub. And, uh, and then the hubs augment those nonstop flights. So if we can't get you there nonstop to a smaller point, hopefully either via Dallas or another one of our hubs or via one of our partners, we're able to, to get you there on a one-stop efficient basis. Yeah, definitely, definitely. 
So let's switch gears a little bit to small cities. That's been, uh, there's, there's been a lot of talk about them with the, the pilot shortage. Some have lost service. Uh, Williamsport, uh, Pennsylvania, and Toledo, Ohio have lost all mainline service. But at the same time, you have uh, Southwest and, to a lesser extent, Spirit adding flights to smaller cities. Southwest, I mean, I think about uh, Colorado Springs, where I have family, and it's, uh, I mean, it's a good sized city, but it always had mediocre air service, and now suddenly Southwest came in and it's the largest airline, and it, it's amazing what it'll do for competition. You know, it went from a CRJ on a Denver COS to an A319 to compete with. But anyway, small cities, what, I mean, what are you happy in there? What, what, how is, is, do we need more Southwest to go into more cities to rejuvenate them, or is it about pilots? What's, you know, how do we keep small city air service going? Um, Adam, I'll let you. Well, I'm pro uh, Southwest going into more of those cities <laughs> and, and creating that Southwest effect. I'm sure uh, we'll have different opinions from the other two gentlemen up here. But uh, no, it, the Southwest effect is still alive. Uh, you can see that in Colorado Springs. You mentioned uh, the Colorado Springs ONDs are higher than they were pre-pandemic. Uh, it was an opportunity that we uh, were very excited about being able to take advantage of. It was always kind of on our radar to go do. Uh, just remember that we would typically have opened one or two cities a year and then opened 18 cities. That I'm kind of done for nine years, so I can hopefully, maybe I'll never open another city again and I'll retire. So, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an exciting time for us. Uh, it was opportunity to, to do that. We think that there's lots of opportunities in the smaller cities. Um, we have always kind of, you've always saw um, uh, Southwest kind of shy away from that. Um, so going forward, uh, you know, it's not just Colorado Springs. Yeah. Uh, we had Sarasota, we had Eugene, Oregon, we had some, some places that were smaller. Bellingham, Washington. Bellingham, is Washington, right. and yeah. the customers and the communities really responded to our presence there. Uh, we connected you to the places that they really want to go, uh, and we're able to provide a service. Bozeman, I mean, it was like everybody's fan favorite last year, it was everybody was flying more capacity to Bozeman, so we just wanted to jump in and be like everybody else, but uh, you can see Bozeman's uh, uh, capacities up, uh, and the, the amount of O and D's going there is substantially uh, increased since you know prior to 2019. So definitely, definitely. Now, Brian, other side of the coin, network carriers are the ones that seems to be playing, like at least in the smallest cities. Uh, Toledo and Williamsport, unfortunately, were American cities. I mean, what's happening there, and how do we keep that air service going? Um, it's a it's a tough nut to crack. Um, it's one thing that I do think a lot about, and. You have regional economics changing because pilots especially are being paid more, so the offer service to a small city is becoming more and more expensive. You have limited pilot resources so that you have a higher opportunity cost for serving those cities as well. And so if you are a small city with one carrier and 50 seaters, it's really hard to make a case for that being viable in the future because the costs are going up. There's no capacity rationalization that could happen to support the market. And so ultimately, that's that small city, absent a, a, a dramatic shift in pilot availability and supply, and for whatever reason it may be, that small city is going to be at risk. And other cities that might have two or three major, major carriers, um, reducing down from three to two or two to one presents a capacity rationalization opportunity for service to continue to be viable there. Perhaps what was nine RJs for three carriers prior to the pandemic now is one carrier with two to three mainline airplanes or two carriers with a mix of mainline and regional airplanes. I don't, my, my crystal ball is no clearer than anyone else's, but you see something's got to give in yep. this market. And at American, we're focused on maintaining as many of these services as we can. I said O&D construction is key to our strategy. So we want to remain in as many of these markets as we can. And I know it was mentioned in a prior presentation, but I think this is where Landline can really play a role. We've got Landline operating the three markets out of Philadelphia right now. We're very eager for the, you know, getting airside um, service in both ends there. And when that happens, we'll be evaluating more opportunities in our network for Landline. Because we think, you know, if you close your eyes when you board the airplane, um, in many cases, you'll be at your connecting hub airport faster than you would have been on a regional jet because um, you're not waiting in a ground delay program. You're not having to taxi at busy, air, um, busy runways, wait for takeoff. So it's a, in the one by two seating. So I'm not here to sell the landline service to anyone in the room, but I think it is a viable replacement for markets that are close to hubs that otherwise would lose service entirely. Yeah, uh, I mean, you did replace one route, uh, Philadelphia Allentown, which hadn't operated since pre-pandemic, but that is now a landline bus. And, right. Uh, you know. 
friends that flew that route would talk about just up and down, basically. Anyway. Uh, John, what do you, what, what does Spirit think of small cities? Because I know you serve, I mean, you've been going to larger and mid-sized markets, but you serve like Latrobe, Pennsylvania, which has always fascinated me. But uh, broadly, I mean, what's small cities of Spirit? Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly, we look at everything. Um, but it, it's funny, when you think about Spirit Airlines, you'd say, well, we're the biggest ULCC, we must fly to all the big cities. The reality is we're only in 57 cities in lower 48 because we have over 30 Caribbean, Latin American destinations as well. By contrast, Frontier has about 100, Legion has about 130. So there's still a lot of opportunity even in that mid midsize. For example, literally tomorrow we're opening up San Antonio. Now most people would have said Spirit's already been in San Antonio for years, we're just starting service there tomorrow. So we see a lot of opportunities still in the midsize arena, but it doesn't stop us from looking at certain markets where we think there's an opportunity to go in, but it's more of a niche play for us, given the size of our aircraft, and, and generally we're looking at a leisure, pretty heavily leisure tilt, tilt to it, like, like Rochester, we recently went in, uh, service to Flor Florida right now. Right, right, that makes sense. So I have to ask this audience question because it, it, it fascinates me. So a very good question, actually. A lot of people in the country moved during the pandemic. How has that influenced future route maps? But I also have to add the why are flights to North Carolina so expensive asking for a friend? <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you guys take the first one? How, how is the pandemic influ people moving to the pandemic influence maps? So, I mean, Brian, go for it. Um, it's, so you've seen a lot, you know, as we've heard about new capacity of Bozeman, Kalispell, Montana, and where people are relocating to. Um, but there's a phrase that goes back in my career that I've used quite a bit, and we saw this in a lot of the mountain markets last year, which there's no level of profitability that capacity can't kill. And so we've, you know, the industry, we the industry added a lot of capacity to these leisure destinations, and the infrastructure wasn't there to support it, the demand wasn't there to support it, and so you've seen that reset this okay. year. And so for smaller markets, I think what we'll see um, as people talk about reduced business travel, if there was a programmer in the Bay Area working at the head office, maybe never traveled for business because they, they wrote code all day, but now they live in Bozeman and uh, they have to go back to the home office four times a year. That'll generate a new trip that we haven't seen before. So a lot of it is just learning and paying attention to where the travel on our network is, is going to and from and, and changing our capacity accordingly. But as companies like the Austin example relocate from California to Austin, we pay attention to that. And as Tesla moves to Austin, they have operations in Reno and we had a new nonstop to Reno to support their, their travel between the two. So we pay attention to where these companies are, where they're going and uh, where their workers are. And, where we can, we'll, uh, we'll adjust our schedules accordingly. And then, as to the second question, why are flights to North Carolina <laughs> so expensive? I'll go back to Finance 101, which is, uh, you know, prices are what the market will bear. And uh, that varies for every product and every category around, uh, around business. Well said, except from the, from the guy who has a large hub in North Carolina, so, <laughs> yes. Adam, you, you, of course, 18 cities during the pandemic, so that's, that's a big change to your map. But. Yeah, it's a big change to our map, and we were, uh, again, it was an exciting time. Uh, we were out, and we were visiting every one of those cities, and, and a big thing that we do is it's not just about, uh, I mean, I draw maps uh, of, of route networks, too, so uh, not every one do I get to do, so it's a fun thing to, to do, Ned. Uh, but um, what we did is we went out again to the community and we, what we wanted to understand is whether what could we provide to the community, what did the community want from Southwest being there, and was it something that we uh, could partner. And, and that's what really made uh, uh, the city kind of come on to our network, is whether we could establish a good partnership there and allow us to, um, to, to, you know, to meet each other's needs. And so um, population obviously is a, a factor, but it's not the only factor. And, and like Brian said, we're, we're gonna pay attention to cities that are growing or growing faster. Uh, you know, obviously that's going to help us. Um, but it's not, again, it's, not, it's just not the only thing, so. Right, right. John, now I know. Yeah, yeah let me, uh, so we, we took a little bit of different approach during the pandemic too. And, and again, to be fair, we knew the demand was in leisure, that primarily in de leisure destinations, in which we already had a lot of capacity in. So our approach really, we didn't, we didn't open nearly any, we, were, we added the fewest new routes in 2020 of any new care, or, or any major care in the US. We really focused on bringing back our historic network. So we, we didn't open any new cities, we just moved forward, bringing capacity, bringing frequency back, 
but we've been following it very closely. I mean, the migration, you know, it started pre-pandemic. You saw a lot of people moving from the state of California to the various destinations. People keep coming to Texas in droves. People come to Florida in droves nowadays. But what, what I think you're seeing is I think people are looking at the pandemic and saying, I don't want to be stuck in certain environments if there's another pandemic. And they're taking, as Brian mentioned, you know, the ability to work remotely or maybe tag a, um, a vacation or a visit to uh, friends and family and work part of that time. I think you're starting to see people look for places where they want to be, whether it's a future retirement home or a getaway or someplace where if the tri-state area is going to be locked up, I want to be uh, in Hilton Head in a condo where I can see the water every day. And I think, so we're watching that very closely. Um, we haven't made any obvious decisions yet, but we are looking at that migration data. And I, I think you'll see us do some things that, you know, basically uh, link into that. Yeah. And I mean, the spirit, as you said, you're filling in your map. You've got the San Antonio, Albuquerque, Reno, like filling in destinations that are good sized cities even before the pandemic and probably were on your list, I would imagine. You know. They were. In fact, in many ways, what we're doing is we were catching up to our plan. So we basically lost a year. So a lot of the things that we did in 21 really were 20, 2020 and so on and so on. A few adjustments, but overall, that's really what we're doing. Yeah, excellent. Um, so I want to ask one, one more sort of broad question for you guys. Um, how has the pandemic changed your sort of international uh, network planning? Um, Brian, of course, you're the only global network and more closer, uh, closer field networks for others on me. But so, um, Adam, first, I mean, how has the inter pandemic changed your international network planning? You said you've resumed all your destinations at this point, but uh, it used to be a big push for Southwest. Yeah, and it's still going to be a push for Southwest. It's just, again, it's prioritization. And so as we, again, added all those domestic cities, it took the aircraft to go do that. So it pushed some of the things further out that you may have wanted to do. The good news is, is there's still opportunities for us out there. Uh, we've got a great customer base that wants to go to these uh, locations. And we know that we have those things to, to do some point. Uh, and more ideas and, and, and uh, things we want to do than you know, planes and pilots to do them, but we'll eventually get that right size and gives me something to do over the next, like I said, next nine, 10 years. So we'll figure it out. It's a good problem. Yep. And then John, of course, Spirit is, I think a lot of people forget this, a large airline to the Caribbean and near Latin America. Has the pandemic changed that strategy at all? Or has it just been, I mean, VFR has come back first. Has it has been full, full steam ahead? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it changed. Uh, my guess is Brian probably saw it too. I mean, Leisure came back, then Leisure slowed down a little bit, and then VFR came back a little bit as you saw some relaxation of the uh, restrictions of the government. And then VFR slowed down a little bit again, and, and then uh, leisure came back earlier this year, and now VFR has really come back nicely. So I, I'd say from, our, from a planning standpoint, um, you know, we haven't seen a change. We typically try to add one or two international destinations, but we also have emphasized adding new gateways to existing international destinations as well. We've been doing a, a little more in Houston uh, probably more recently. Yeah. And then Brian, to you, I mean, it's a bit of a different scale with, with Americans' global reach, but um, how has the pandemic changed some of your international planning? You've... You know, we have a broad international network, as you know, and it's, it, the rules are different depending on which region you're applying to, and, and the strategy is different depending on which region we're applying to. In Latin America, for example, we're, we're the leading carrier to and from the U.S. and Latin America. We have a strong Caribbean presence. Mexico is also strong. Um, we're not as strong in Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic, and we're relying on our partnerships to augment our own flying there. Um, and the pandemic really put the strategy on pause, I would say. We've, um, prior to the pandemic, we flew a number of aircraft and routes that were seasonal in nature. So we would take an A330, we would fly it to a seasonal destination in Europe for three months, feel good about the profits that we made there, but you can't run that route year round and you end up taking that airplane and running it domestically, a wide body airplane domestically is a really diff difficult way to turn profit. And so we'd bury the loss in the, in the domestic network um, with that airplane for the rest of the year. So we took the opportunity of the pandemic to resize our wide body fleet so that 
we are interested in routes that are either countercyclical or that we can support year round okay. um, so that we're not saddling the domestic network with those wide bodies when a 321 is just going to knock the socks off the wide body in terms of profitability. So New Mallorca or Tenerife for American. So those, those <laughs> kinds of destinations are sexy for some network planners, but for American network planners, the sexiest thing is profitability. So we will uh, we'll continue to pursue that. And, uh, and, and looking forward, we're you know, working on seamlessness with our partners like British Airways to ensure that when a, a passenger connects in Heathrow, that they will have upgrade availability on the BA leg, they'll be able to use their miles, they'll have their status recognized. All of these things that are important, if you're going to use your partners to augment your network, your customers need to see it that way as well. And so our focus right now is more of a seamlessness strategy to help the network strategy than it is a network strategy itself or in isolation. Okay, excellent. So um, I'm gonna, we've got a minute and a half left, so I'm gonna do a quick lightning round, a question for each of you, quick, okay. All right, John, A321 XLR, Europe. Do you go to Europe? Uh, highly, highly unlikely, I mean, I, I never say no in this business, but highly unlikely in the next five years. Fair enough. Adam, Max 10, is that on your radar? Well, I've learned from John never to say no in this business, but uh, <laughs> what I would uh, say is I want to also learn from Jude uh, Bricker, so I don't want to say anything about any aircraft and then get it reported out uh, in the next uh, week or two. So, um, so anyways, now I, we've got lots of opportunities for the Max 7, Max 8. We've got a lot of those on order, uh, and we see that as our, as our future going forward. Excellent. And Brian, is the San Jose hub going to make a comeback? <laughs> no. <laughs> there you have it. I'd like to thank all of our guests today. Uh, so thank you so much, Brian, Adam, John, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.